Thank you, and thanks to the organizers for the, uh, for the invitation. Uh, so Dr. Eisen apologized for not talking about humans. I'm going to do worse. I'm going to demote them to the level of hosts, uh, so I apologize. Um, okay, so uh, we're looking at dengue virus and its adaptation to uh, its different hosts. And so um, in, our, in our labs, uh, sort of in this interface between the Andina lab, which is a virology lab, uh, historically, and the Friedman lab, which is more a cellular biology focus, um, we're interested in the interplay of host cells and, uh, and viruses. And so on the left here, I'm showing a, a number of the, the constraints from the virus side, uh, things like high error rates associated with viruses, uh, the replication kinetics uh, of viruses are, uh, very fast, um, capsid stability and structural complexity. And these are all sort of answered by different uh, pressures on the host side. So things like uh, the protein quality control uh, mechanisms in the cell, codon usage for various hosts, uh, immune pressure, uh, and temperature. And dengue virus is uh, an interesting system, not only because it's an, an important pathogen. And so uh, in this uh, map here, I'm showing the global distribution of, of dengue. Uh, and then up here, you, if you've flown recently, you've seen this poster uh, near the security line. Uh, it says, uh, if you've been to the Caribbean, I would probably say maybe if you've been anywhere, uh, you should uh, wear some bug spray. Uh, okay, so uh, it's an important uh, medical uh, uh, virus, uh, but it's also interesting uh, in terms of evolution. And, uh, and the reason is, uh, it has to cycle between two hosts. So, uh, and these hosts are very different. Uh, so we have the 80s mosquito uh, and Homo sapiens, and uh, the virus has to uh, replicate in both of these. Um, and uh, while the, the sort of general biology of replication of this virus is the same in these two hosts, uh, you know, in, in entry, uncoding of the uh, viral RNA, which is basically an mRNA uh, that expresses a single polyprotein that's cleaved by cellular uh, and, and viral proteases. Uh, it makes 10 proteins. Those 10 proteins set up a replication complex uh, in association with the ER. Uh, this makes virus, and then the virus uh, egresses from the cell. Now those processes are generally the same between these two hosts, but they differ in a lot of important ways. Uh, the mechanisms of antiviral immunity are very different between these hosts. Uh, the temperature uh, that the virus has to replicate in these hosts is very different. The types of tissues that the virus encounters in these hosts, and the host factors that are available to assist in replication are very different as well. Uh, and so this sets up uh, what, what we like to think of as a complex fitness landscape where the virus uh, population has to traverse these two uh, landscapes that are set up by these uh, different environments in these host cells, uh, and, uh, but must maintain a population that can pass between these two landscapes uh, to maintain uh, the chain of infection. And so you might imagine a sort of generalist population that lives between these two landscapes and then specialist populations that emerge in each host. Uh, but actually, understanding the relative topography of these landscapes is, is difficult. Uh, so we can imagine a lot of different uh, arrangements of these landscapes uh, where you have one host, sort of the generalist host, one a specialist host, uh, or perhaps they're, they're completely overlapping. And so we'd like to understand uh, how this works. Uh, so I'll start by talking about uh, the adaptation experiment we've done. Uh, then I'll explain the high-resolution population sequencing procedure uh, that we use to sequence these populations. Uh, then uh, run through some estimations of mutation rates and relative fitness of alleles in these populations. And finally, uh, a, a genotype fitness landscape uh, that is derived from experimental data, and I'll show you how we generate that and, and what that looks like. Okay, so here's the uh, rather complicated experiment that we've been doing. Uh, so we take uh, Dengue 2. Uh, this is a, a common serotype that's used in the lab. Uh, we infect either human or mosquito-derived cell, uh, cell lines. So either HUH7, this is a human hepatoma-derived cell line, or C636, this is a, uh, an 80s albopictus-derived cell line. We infect these at low MOI to uh, prevent recombination between, uh, between different viruses. Uh, we allow this to grow uh, in cell culture. We quantify that. Uh, we, sit, we pass uh, the same uh, inoculum to... Uh, uh, to cells again, and we save the rest of the virus for later characterization. Okay, and so this is what the phenotypes of these adapting populations look like. Uh, so here I'm showing human adapted on the left uh, and mosquito adapted on the right. And what we see is an increase in titers and for two replicate populations, A and B. Uh, we see increases in titers uh, on humans 
and on mosquitoes, so the adapted host, uh, the virus is getting better at growing in the adapted host. But when we plate these populations onto the alternative bypassed host, we see uh, rather flat uh, viability uh, on C636 from the human adapted populations, and we see a decrease in titers uh, on uh, human cells with the mosquito adapted populations. And so there's a sort of asymmetric trade-off uh, between these two um, uh, adaptation schemes. And so to really understand what's going on in these populations, we need to go very deep. Uh, and so uh, we've developed a t technique uh, in the Andino lab to look at uh, populations in very high resolution. Oh my. Uh, okay, so, uh, so now we have a, a technique that we can use to see uh, at or below RNA, mutation, RNA virus mutation rates. So it works like this. Um, Basically, it's a standard RNA-seq procedure, except that we circularize uh, fragmented RNAs uh, after uh, purifying them. Uh, we then do a rolling circle reverse transcription of these and build a consensus sequence that allows us to find the original mutant sequence uh, from a, a bunch of RNA sequencing uh, errors. And when we do this, uh, we get uh, a spectrum of mutations that looks something like this. So we're clicking through. Uh, these different passage uh, populations, and you can see alleles uh, going up and down. Uh, red is non-synonymous, blue is synonymous, and uh, that will uh, be the same throughout the talk. Uh, so this is really, I think, fun to watch, but it's not so informative. Uh, and so we started uh, to look at the fitness of these different alleles. So we're looking at the trajectories, uh, the frequency trajectories of these alleles in the population, and assigning fitness values to them. And this is the distribution of fitness effects that we see, or DFE. Uh, as expected, you see a peak at neutrality at one, and you also see a, a large peak at lethality at zero. Uh, and you can see that synonymous mutations are enriched at the neutral peak uh, in both of these populations, and we have an, an enrichment in non-synonymous mutations in the lethal peak. We can further break down these DFEs to look at, uh, so here are the background distribution uh, in white, red and blue again, non-synonymous and synonymous. We look at mutations in the viral UTR, and we see a, a large proportion are lethal. And if we look at nonsense mutations along the genome, we see the vast majority, uh, if not all of them, are lethal. Uh, we can further break down non-synonymous substitutions as well to conservative and non-conservative substitutions. And again, we see the expected relationship uh, with fitness. If we look at these populations over time, so now we're looking at uh, the distribution of fitness uh, on, the, uh, on the X here, on the Y passage number going backwards, uh, and then uh, the frequency of a given uh, allele fitness. And so we start with a population that has a lot of, uh, sort of deleterious mutations as well as neutral, and over time these high fitness mutations are accumulating and driving out these uh, deleterious and neutral alleles. Uh, the effect of this behavior is an increase in mean fitness over the course of the experiment. And uh, so we wanted to know if this mean fitness estimate that we were getting, and this is completely based on the frequencies from the experiment, uh, if that uh, uh, excuse me, agreed with uh, the biology that we were observing for these virus populations. Uh, and indeed it does. So uh, I'm showing on the X the mean fitness values from uh, our frequency uh, data, and then on the Y uh, the titer uh, that I measured and, sh and showed you earlier. And we see very good agreement in all populations uh, with the trajectories and mean fitness. If we look at uh, what these populations are doing more broadly, uh, we use principal components analysis to stratify these populations. And what we see is from this wild type origin, uh, the human adapted populations moving in one direction, mosquito populations moving in orthogonal direction. Uh, and the first two components here capture about 85% of the variance in the population, or in the experiment. Um, and you see that these are host specific uh, components. If we look at the third and fourth components that explain about 15% of the data, uh, we see uh, the replicate populations now diverging. And so this says that these uh, evolutionary trajectories that the virus is traversing uh, are very reproducible, uh, at least in this, in this simplified system. Uh, and then again, we can take these host-specific components uh, and we can see this nice divergence of these populations uh, as they adapt uh, in these dominant components here. And we can capture all the variants uh, from that by uh, fitting a 2D representation of genetic distance between these populations. And so we're using uh, Weir-Reynolds distance uh, to uh, fit a 2D representation of, these, uh, of this experiment. 
Uh, so again, the wild type population here at the origin, and now you see these, pop these uh, viral populations, uh, lineages moving away from this origin uh, in host-specific sort of orthogonal trajectories. Uh, and I'm also showing the diversity of these populations uh, as, as entropy, as uh, Shannon index. And you see uh, that there is some variation, especially when uh, these trajectories start to slow down, you see an accumulation of diversity after, uh, after that. Uh, so I said I would like to uh, generate a sort of genotype fitness landscape, uh, and we think about this uh, often in virology, um, and uh, uh, there's a number of ways to represent it. One is uh, as a network of connected mutations or connected genotypes. Another is to sort of flatten this out and look at fitness uh, on this landscape. And so we have sort of a hybrid method where we take uh, a measurement, uh, is rear, uh, weir reynolds distance, fit it on a 2D representation, and then take biological data and plot that uh, vertically. And so now I'm showing here uh, on the, the sort of shadow here is the uh, multidimensional scaling fit of genetic distance between these populations. And then uh, the increases in titer on the adapted hosts and the decreases uh, or, or uh, sort of stagnant uh, titers uh, on the alternative hosts. And uh, so if this was our, our original goal, uh, we can sort of uh, fit uh, a representation, a similar representation onto this plot, and we can see that there's a much greater trade-off with human adaptation when you go back to mosquitoes than you see with human adapted populations uh, when plated, uh, I'm sorry, mosquito adapted populations when plated on humans. Um, and so this is sort of the, the model that we favor now. Um, and this actually matches with what we know from epidemiology of the virus. Uh, so it takes about 10 particles uh, de delivered by a mosquito to infect a human. It takes a, uh, a blood meal containing about 10,000 particles to infect a mosquito. So that sort of reflects this kind of asymm asymmetry uh, in these uh, populations. So in closing, am I, am I out of time, I guess? Uh, okay. Uh, so in closing, I've shown you uh, that we can take this frequency-based uh, uh, estimates of, of fitness and we can build... Uh, these uh, experimentally derived fitness landscapes from them. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll thank uh, my two collaborators on this project, Shuhei, uh, sort of our resident uh, lab magician, uh, and Mauricio, who is a, a visiting student. Uh, he presented a poster last night on um, an, another extension to this technique uh, where we can do high resolution uh, insertion and deletion mapping. Uh, and if you have questions on that, uh, please talk to Mauricio or I. And thank you. Awesome. Um, any questions for Dr. Dolan? Oh, in the back here? Okay, I'll come to you. Um, so what do you think the uh, trade-off has to do with the different thermal environments of the uh, mosquito host and the human host? Yeah, so, uh, thanks. Uh, so we are starting to look at delta-delta G mutation. Uh, and hoping to, to look at this in two different uh, uh, temperature regimes and see if we can start to uh, sort of dissect these, these fitnesses and how stability affects those. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Maybe one more. <laughs> one in the back? Okay. Um, how much is known of the interactomes, both in human and in mosquito, and could you imagine like parsing your data having uh, one side the common interactions and the other side the different interactions and see if it makes a difference with what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so in my PhD, I, I uh, did protein-protein interactions um, in viruses. And uh, so that's actually something I'd love to do, uh, see how these things constrain the evolution of uh, viruses or uh, or drive the evolution in, in one host or the other. But we haven't, uh, haven't looked at that in depth. Mostly we just have binary interactions, this protein and this protein, but not interaction sites. So it's, it's more difficult. Okay. One more, okay. Dr. Feldman? Yeah. Uh -oh. um, how would it, uh, all of this change if uh, instead we believed some of the things that are being reported about Zika, that it's sexually transmitted? How would, how would that change? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that's a, it's a good question. Um, so I think uh, when you start to talk about tissues and uh, these sort of stages of infection that go on in a, in a host, um, 
the, these models don't really apply anymore, right? Uh, so, um, it, yeah, I, I can't really say much from, from our data uh, about that. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Great, thank you so much.